Hi guys, this is Shannon and this is No Shelf Control. I'm back today with eight more titles that I'm excited about that released yesterday on May 23rd. I hope that you enjoy hearing these new releases every week because I'm always excited to bring them to you. I'm always excited to add new books to my TBR and I figure by bringing you the list of new books every week, you get to add to your TBR as well. Let's get started. Number nine is by one of my favorite children's authors, but it is not a children's book. So this is by Kwame Alexander, and it is called Why Fathers Cry at Night. It is published by Little Brown and Company, and it is 240 pages. It's called Why Fathers Cry at Night, a memoir in love poems, letters, recipes, and remembrances. So aside from being one of my favorite children's authors, he's also gonna write in poems, letters, and recipes, which you know I love an alternative format book. Um, so let's read a little bit about what Kwame Alexander is gonna bring us in this memoir. This powerful memoir by a number one New York Times bestselling author and Newbery medalist features poetry, letters, recipes, and other personal artifacts that provide an intimate look into his life and the loved ones he shares it with. In an intimate and non-traditional or new fashioned memoir, Kwame Alexander shares snapshots of a man learning how to love. He takes us through stories from his being awkward newlyweds in the sticky Chicago summer of 1967 to the sometimes confusing ways they showed their love to each other and for him. He explores his own relationships, his difficulties as a newly wedded 22 year old father and the precariousness of his early marriage working in a jazz club with his second wife. Alexander attempts to deal with the unraveling of his marriage and the grief of his mother's recent passing while sharing the solace he found in learning how to perfect her famous fried chicken dish. With an open heart, Alexander weaves together memories of his past and tries to understand his greatest accomplishment, his daughters. Full of heartfelt reminiscence, family recipes, love poems, and personal letters, Why Fathers Cry at Night inspires bravery and vulnerability in every reader who has experienced the reckless passion heartbreak, failure, and joy that define the whirlwind woes and wonders of love. So I'm really interested. I met Kwame Alexander at a book signing. He was wonderful. Um, he ha was signing children's books and talked a little bit about Muhammad Ali. And I have a picture of myself as a little girl standing with Muhammad Ali that I had the opportunity to show him and we had a really cool talk. So um, I've been a Kwame Alexander fan ever since then. Well, actually before then, because I loved his children's books, but that he's also a really cool guy, didn't hurt anything at all. So I am very interested in his memoir and I hope you will be as well. Number 10 on my list of 16 is The Good Enough Job, Reclaiming Life from Work. And the blurb says, Superb, by Oliver Berkeman, New York Times bestselling author of 4,000 Weeks. This is by Simone Stoltzoff. It is published by Portfolio and it's 272 pages. A challenge to the tyranny of work and a call to reclaim our lives from its clutches. From the moment we ask children what they want to be when they grow up, we exalt the dream job as if it were life's ultimate objective. Many entangle their identities with their jobs with predictable damage to happiness, well-being, and even professional success. In The Good Enough Job, journalist Simone Stoltzoff traces how work has come to dominate Americans' lives and why we find it so difficult to let go. Based on groundbreaking reporting and interviews with Michelin star chefs, Wall Street bankers, overwhelmed teachers, and other workers across the American economy, Stoltzoff exposes what we lose when we expect work to be more than a job. Rather than treat work as a calling or a dream, he asks what it would take to reframe work as part of life rather than the entirety of our lives. What does it mean for a job to be good enough? Through provocative critique and deep reporting, Stoltzoff punctures the myths that keep us chained to our jobs. By exposing the lies that we and our employers tell about the value of our labor, the good enough job makes the urgent case for reclaiming our lives in a world centered around work. And this book really called to me because my husband and I talk about this all the time. 
I'm a 150 percenter. I give 150 percent to everything I do all the time. Um, it means that I'm exhausted, but I get a lot done. <laughs> My husband, on the other hand, his goal in life is to make the maximum amount of money for the minimum amount of effort and find that sweet spot where he's doing 75 percent of what he could and his employer is thrilled. Um, and the part that really frosts my muffin most of the time is his employers love him at 75% as much as mine do at 150%. And our salaries are very similar. <laughs> so there is something to finding a way to work to live rather than living to work. Um, and this book is about that. Um, so I am intrigued beyond measure to read what Simone Stoltzoff has to say and learn perhaps how I can find a way to make my identity less about what I do as and more about who I am. So um, very interesting read in my opinion. Number 11 on my list is The Senator's Wife by Liv Constantine. And Liv Constantine wrote The Last Mrs. Parrish, which you may have heard of. Um, it was a best-selling Reese's Book Club pick. And this one is the senator's wife. It has this broken glass around what I think might be cherry blossoms. I'm not sure. Um, and then a window that looks almost like the White House, but I'm sure it's the senator's home. This one is published by Bantam, and it's 320 pages, and it's set in Washington, D.C., a DC philanthropist suspects that her seemingly perfect employee is secretly plotting to steal her husband, her reputation, even her life, in this seductive novel of psychological suspense from the internationally best-selling author of The Last Mrs. Parrish. In this town, anyone is replaceable. After a tragic chain of events led to the deaths of their spouses two years ago, D.C. philanthropist Sloan Chase and Senator Whit Montgomery are finally starting to move on. The horrifying ordeal drew them together, and now they're ready to settle down again with each other. As Sloan returns to the world of White House dinners and political small talk, this time with her new husband, she's also preparing for an upcoming hip replacement, the latest reminder of the lupus diagnosis she's managed since her 20s. With both of their hectic schedules, they decide that hiring a home health aide will give Sloan the support and independence she needs post-surgery, and they find the perfect fit in Athena Karras. Seemingly a godsend, Athena tends to Sloan and even helps her run her charitable foundation. But Sloan slowly begins to deteriorate, a complication, Athena explains, of Sloan's lupus. As weeks go by, Sloan becomes sicker, and her uncertainty quickly turns to paranoia as she begins to suspect the worst. Why is Athena asking her so many probing questions about her foundation, about her past? And could Sloane be imagining the sultry, sultry looks between Athena and her new husband? Riveting, fast-paced, and full of unbelievable twists, The Senator's Wife is a psychological thriller that upends the private homes of those who walk the halls of power, because when you have it all, you have everything to lose. Ooh, so psychological thriller with unbelievable twists. I love good twists. Um, so I'm really hopeful. I also love DC. Um, I lived there. I was um, an intern for a congressman and really enjoyed my time there. I thought I was the big time. I was 19 or 20 um, congressional intern and really fell in love with DC at that time. We've been back a couple of times on trips and I still love it. So, um, and being a political science major, that whole political arena is something that really appeals to me. So riveting twists, DC, political culture, I'm in. So that was number 11 on my list. Number 12 is Mrs. Nash's Ashes by Sarah Adler. And the blurb says, soft, sweet, and utterly enchanting, a delightfully funny and poignant romance that sticks with you. And that quote is from Ali Ashley Poston, New York Times bestselling author of The Dead Romantics. So Sarah Adler, this is published by Berkeley and it's 352 pages. Here's the synopsis. A most anticipated book by Book Riot, Culture S, and more. A starry-eyed romantic, a cynical writer, and the ashes of an elderly woman 
take the road trip of a lifetime that just might upend everything they believe about true love. Millicent Watts Cohen is on a mission. When she promised her elderly best friend that she'd reunite her with the woman she fell in love with nearly 80 years ago, she never imagined that would mean traveling from D.C. to Key West with three tablespoons of Mrs. Nash's remains in her backpack. But Millie's determined to give her friend a symbolic happily ever after before it's really too late and hopefully reassure herself of love's lasting power in the process. She just didn't expect to have a living travel companion. After a computer glitch grounds flights, Millie is forced to catch a ride with Hollis Hollenbeck, an also stranded acquaintance from her ex's MFA program. Hollis certainly does not believe in happily ever afters, symbolic or otherwise, and makes it quite clear that he can't fathom Millie's plan ending well for anyone. But as they contend with peculiar bed and breakfasts, unusual small town festivals, and deer with a death wish, Millie begins to suspect that her reluctant travel partner might enjoy her company more than he lets on. Because for someone who supposedly doesn't share her views on romance, Hollis sure is becoming invested in the success of their journey. And the closer they get to their destination, the more Millie has to admit that maybe this trip isn't just about Mrs. Nash's love story after all. Maybe it's also about her own. This reminds me of one of my favorite books of all time by Monica Wood called The One in a Million Boy. Now, The One in a Million Boy is not a romance necessarily. It is not a rom-com. It has some really poignant, devastating pieces to it. But there is a road trip that sort of follows this kind of path. Um, so I'm really intrigued. The whole idea of a road trip, the whole idea of a romance based on a road trip and all of the things that can happen on a road trip to two people um, really is interesting to me. So I'm going to check out Mrs. Nash's Ashes just to see where it goes. Number 13 is On Fire Island by Jane L. Rosen, the author of A Shoe Story and Eliza Starts a Rumor. Now, Eliza Starts a Rumor is another book I started <laughs> and flightily did not finish, um, but we'll get back to, I promise. Um, the blurb on this book says, Count Me In as Jane L. Rosen's Biggest Fan by Elin Hildebrand. And she is there on the beach reading a book with a gorgeous hat, um, sort of like the other cover that we saw, but this one is a little bit more hand-drawn, and uh, but both the kind of day I wish I was having. This one is published by Berkeley, and it's 320 pages. Dazzling, as funny as it is poignant, nostalgic as it is sharp, Carly Fortune, New York Times best-selling author of Every Summer After. A book editor spends one last summer on Fire Island in this sparkling and surprising new novel from the author of A Shoe Story. As a book editor, Julia Morse lived and breathed stories, whether with her pen to a manuscript or curled up with a book while at her beloved Fire Island cottage, her imagination alight with a good tale, she could anticipate practically any ending, the ending she'd never imagined was her own. To be fair, no one expects to die at 37. So when the unthinkable happens to Julia, rather than following the light at the end of the proverbial tunnel, she chooses to spend one last summer near those she loves most. As she follows her adoring novelist husband Ben to their unexpectedly full home on Fire Island, she discovers the ripple effect her life has had on the trajectory of so many. Her baseball-loving, young-at-heart neighbor who believes it's best not to go it alone, two bright-eyed teenagers eager to become adults, and her best friend who must shake off heartbreak for a new chance at love. With poignant comedy and insight, On Fire Island is an ode to the stories all around us and to the brightest types of loves for the people closest to you and the places that shape you. So this is interesting to me in that it's different from a rom-com or romance novel in that Julia Morse dies. She's coming back as a ghost from the light. Um, and she's going to see how her life impacted others. I love that idea. It's a little bit um, Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, a little Whoopi Goldberg. Um, and I, I'm curious, you know, the whole idea that we come back from somewhere and we could actually watch and see 
how we, you know, influence the lives of others is really, really interesting to me. So um, I want to check that one out differently than um, I would check out a regular romance or rom-com. Number 14 is When the World Didn't End, and it's a memoir by Guinevere Turner. And I love this picture of this little girl peeking out from the door. Um, she's very sort of 1970s, maybe. Um, she looks like I did when I was a little girl, so maybe. Um, this one is published by Crown, and it's 336 pages. In this immersive spellbinding memoir, an acclaimed screenwriter tells the story of her childhood growing up with the infamous Lyman family cult and the complicated and unexpected pain of leaving the only home she'd ever known. On January 5th, 1975, the world was supposed to end. Under strict instructions from her family leader, seven-year-old Guinevere Turner put on her best dress, grabbed her favorite toy, and waited for her salvation a spaceship that would take her and her peers to live on Venus. But the spaceship never came. Guinevere did not understand her family was a cult. She spent most of her days on a compound in Kansas, living with dozens of other children who worked in the sorghum fields and roved freely through the surrounding pastures, eating mulberries and tending to farm animals. But there was a dark side to this bucolic existence. When selected girls in her community turned 12 or 13, they were given to older men on the compound as wives in training. Turner was part of the Lyman family, a cult spearheaded by Mel Lyman, a self-proclaimed world savior, committed to isolation from a world he declared had lost its way. When Guinevere caught the attention of Jessie, the queen of the family, her status was elevated, and suddenly she was traveling in the inner circle caravan between communities in Los Angeles, Boston, and Martha's Vineyard. Then, at age 11, Guinevere's world as she had known it ended. Her mother, from whom she had been separated since age three, left the family with a disgraced member, and Guinevere and her four-year-old sister were forced to go with her. Traveling outside the bounds of her cloistered existence, Guinevere was thrust into public school for the first time, a stranger in a strange world with homemade clothes, clueless to social codes. Now, in the world she'd been raised to believe was evil, she faced challenges and horrors she couldn't have imagined. Drawing from the diaries that she kept throughout her youth, Guinevere Turner's memoir is an intimate and heart-wrenching chronicle of a childhood touched with extraordinary beauty and unfathomable ugliness, the ache of yearning to return to a lost home, and the slow realization of how harmful that place really was. So, you know, this is probably both heartbreaking and incredibly interesting. Um, this poor young woman had life, you know, just the way she wanted it inside a cult and only believed what she knew and then left the cult, probably saving her life and potentially her innocence, um, but extracted from something she loved and forced into something she knew nothing about and didn't fit in with. Um, so I am absolutely fascinated to read the story of Guinevere Turner's life um, and how she managed to get through this abrupt change um, and survive. So I think this one is really, really intriguing and uh, can't wait to give it a try. Number 15 is On Our Best Behavior, The Seven Deadly Sins and the Price Women Pay to Be Good by Elise Lonen. This one is 384 pages, and it is published by the Dial Press. Here's the synopsis. A groundbreaking exploration of the ancient rules women unwittingly follow in order to be considered good, revealing how the seven deadly sins still control and distort their lives and illuminating a path toward a more balanced, spiritually complete way to live. Women congratulate themselves when they resist the donut in the office break room. They celebrate their restraint when they hold back from sending an email in anger. They feel virtuous when they wake up at dawn to get a jump on the day. They put other needs, others' needs ahead of their own and believe this makes them exemplary. In On Our Best Behavior, journalist Elise Lonen explains that these impulses, often lauded as unselfish, distinctly feminine instincts, are actually ingrained in women by a culture that reaps the benefits via an extraordinarily effective collection of mores known as the seven deadly sins. 
Since being codified by the Christian church in the fourth century, the seven deadly sins, pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth have exerted insidious power. Even today in our largely secular patriarchal society, they continue to circumscribe women's behavior. For example, seeing sloth as sinful leads women to deny themselves rest. A fear of gluttony drives them to ignore their appetites, and an aversion to greed prevents them from negotiating for themselves and contributes to the 55% gender wealth gap. Lonin reveals how women have been programmed to obey the rules represented by these sins and how doing so qualifies them as good. This probing analysis of contemporary culture and thoroughly researched history explains how women have internalized the patriarchy and how they unwittingly reinforce it. By sharing her own story and the spiritual wisdom of other traditions, Lonan shows how women can break free and discover the integrity and wholeness they seek. So this is a perspective I've never heard before, this idea that the reason that women sort of suffer and don't stretch in ways that men do um, is because of the seven deadly sins and how this has been, you know, indoctrinated into us. So I was really curious about, you know, this idea and what she's going to say and the stories she's going to tell that um, show her research into this topic. So, you know, as you've heard me say before, I'm not a very religious person, but I believe that our society is, you know, inculcated by religious doctrine, um, whether we are aware of it and mean to follow it or not, it's part of who we are in America. And so um, really curious about what um, Lonan has to say about this topic. I may or may not buy it um, once I read it, but um, something that, I, you know, she got my attention and I'm willing to give it a read and see what she's thinking. So uh, that is On Our Best Behavior. The Seven Deadly Sins and the Price Women Pay to Be Good. And the last one on my list is called The Book of Charlie. And this is Wisdom from the Remarkable American Life of a 109-Year-Old Man by David Von Driel. It is published by Simon & Schuster and it is 208 pages. One of our nation's most prominent writers finds the truth about how to live a long and happy life in the centenarian next door. When a veteran Washington journalist moved to Kansas, he met a new neighbor who was more than a century old. Little did he know that he was beginning a long friendship and a profound lesson in the meaning of life. Charlie White was no ordinary neighbor. Born before radio, Charlie lived long enough to use a smartphone. When a shocking tragedy interrupted his idyllic boyhood, Charlie mastered survival strategies that reflect thousands of years of human wisdom. Thus armored, Charlie's sense of adventure carried him on an epic journey across the continent and later found him swinging across bandstands of the Jazz Age, racing aboard ambulances through Depression-era gangster wars, improvising techniques for early open-heart surgery, and cruising the Amazon as a guest of Peru's president. David Von Driel came to understand that Charlie's resilience and willingness to grow made this remarkable neighbor a master in the art of thriving through times of dramatic change. As a gift to his children, he set out to tell Charlie's secrets. The Book of Charlie is a gospel of grit, the inspiring story of one man's journey through a century of upheaval. The history that unfolds through Charlie's story reminds you that the United States has always been a divided nation, a questing nation, an inventive nation, a nation of Charlies in the roller coaster pursuit of a good and meaningful life. So I'm interested in reading about Charlie. He's 109 years old. Let's hear his stories. It reminds me a little bit of Tuesdays with Maury, but not quite as maybe sappy. Um, I did enjoy Tuesdays with Maury. I can love a good sappy book as much as the next person, but this seems a little bit more... Um, factual, a little bit more reporting style, um, journalistic. So um, I'm still interested in hearing Charlie's stories. And when I read this, I thought, yeah, I want to know what wisdom a 109-year-old man, you know, has to share with me. 
I have a 95 year old grandmother and God knows she tells me how to live my life. So i um, really interested in reading this and seeing uh, how David Von Driel portrays Charlie and tells his secrets. So those are the remaining eight books being published May 23rd that I think are incredibly interesting. As you'll notice, they are very different from what I usually choose. I don't think there was a single book in the list of 16 that was sort of a standard for me. Um, so I'm hoping that I found some things that might appeal to those of you who don't usually read, this, read the things that I love. So give those a try. Let me know what you think. Is there something in there that really appealed to you? Um, if you loved this, please click like and subscribe. I would love to know about it so that I can continue to do videos that you will enjoy. Um, keep coming back. I have lots more to share with you every Tuesday and Wednesday, sometimes even Thursday, depending upon how many books there are in a given week. I like to do the new releases and tell you what I'm excited about, but I do a lot of single book reviews um, and some bookstore tours, and I have a lot of surprises up my sleeve. So stick around. I can't wait to talk more bookish things with you, and uh, we'll get together again soon. Take care. Bye.